Good evening. Welcome to tonight's live stream. I am going to get started in a moment. I just need to let everyone on social media know that the stream is currently on the air. Now, before I get into tonight's topic, I wanted to give everybody a little bit of bad news. The Sean James Initiative MacBook Pro has died. And this was a laptop that was I got with the help of all of the viewers out here who donated to the Sean James Initiative. And I used that to improve the quality of my videos over the last couple of years. Unfortunately, this laptop sadly has a bad keyboard, and because the keyboard went bad and, I, and it just died, I cannot boot this computer. And even worse, as I tried to fix it, sadly, what happened to the ribbon cable to the hard drive is that it's just basically torn at this point. So the Sean James Initiative MacBook Pro that was, I bought from 20 back in 2018 is now more so just um, let's give a moment of silence for the Sean James Initiative MacBook Pro. And I wouldn't have got this without the support of viewers as related to that initiative to take this channel to the next level. And I thank all you viewers for helping me get this laptop. And I have another one that I'm using right now to make this live stream. So I thank God for your support on that. Now with that perfunctory said, I wanna get into a progress report on the SJS Direct 2024 catalog. Now the first book of the SJS Direct 2024 catalog has launched and is now available in paperback and that is John Haynes Illuminati. And you can get your copy of John Haynes Illuminati in paperback right now on amazon.com. And you can also get John Haynes Illuminati at other online booksellers like draft to digital Google Play, Barnes & Noble, and you can also possibly find it on Walmart and Target. So that is the first book of the SJS Direct 2024 catalog. And this month on April 26th, I will be releasing Isis Dark Incubus. Now this is a big book in the Isis series. It's over 150 pages. And with it being over 150 pages, it starts the third story arc of the Isis series, which has already gone through two story arcs. The first one started with 2012's Omari's Revenge, and it ended the first story arc with All About the Goddess, and the second story arc started with Isis Wrath of the Cyber Goddess and ended with Isis Legacy. And this is a story that explores Isis and her struggles to find love because of the issues she has as related to white supremacy having an impact on her mind all those years ago. And this story really explores black love and white supremacy's impact on the black woman's mind as related to white supremacy. So this is a very big action packed epic story that's really like a bit of a psychological horror movie like Jordan Peele kind of produces. 
And this is one that I definitely want you guys to pick up because it's an entry point into the ISIS series. Well, all the books in the ISIS series are entry points. And this one is going to be very deep and psychological. So this is one you don't want to miss. And you can pre-order your copy on Kindle and digital formats such as Draft the Digital, Google Play, and Barnes & Noble's Nook in the iBookstore right now. Or you can wait for the paperback to come on April 26th. Now, the third book that's coming out in May 24th is A Steam Horror in the Hamptons. And this third book that will be coming out is the last book of the SJS Direct 2024 catalog. And this one features the aspiring Angel and John Haynes as they tie up some loose ends from the vampire saga. So this one is a fun story that really explores a lot of the last little bits of the vampire lore in the SJS Direct universe. And this one will be coming out on May 24th and you can pre-order your copy on Amazon.com right now or other online booksellers like Draft the Digital, Google Play, Barnes and Noble, and also uh, the paperback will be available on May 24th on Amazon. So I don't want you to miss out on any of these great SJS Direct Universe books that are available right now. And with all that being said about the books of the SJS Direct 2024 catalog, this really segues into tonight's topic. And tonight's topic is where I'm going to be talking about Netflix's Good Times reboot and the fear of black excellence. Now, three years ago, I talked about this Netflix reboot of Good Times, and I knew it wasn't going to be a good time for black people when I heard the names associated with it. And the names associated with this reboot were Norman Lear and Seth MacFarlane. And when it came to those two individuals, they were all a part of the media arm of white supremacy. And when it comes to the media arm of white supremacy and black entertainment, the media arm of white supremacy isn't about presenting black excellence to black people. No, it's all about presenting the absolute worst image of black people to black people. And this is done deliberately by design because when it comes to this media, like Professor Black Truth talks about in many of his videos, he tells you that the media is mind control and it's all about controlling black people's perceptions of self through this media, which is designed to program an idea in black people's minds that we cannot go out here and achieve excellence and they don't want you to think about ever aspiring to be excellent because when it comes to the media arm of white supremacy, the ultimate goal of their media is to go out and program an idea in your mind to make you believe that you are a failure. That is the ultimate goal of mainstream media when it comes to the black image. And I came to this observation way back in my 20s when I was out here looking to try to submit books to all of these trade publishers. And I came to that observation, I mean, one time, I mean, my family member, she gave me a book called Losing Absalom. And as I was working on my book, I was reading these books and I noticed a pattern with many of these books. And that pattern was, presenting black people as failures. And this was again done by design because the, again, the media arm of white supremacy's goal is mind control. And they want to get you to start thinking of yourself, one, in a second class status, and two, get you thinking about yourself as a failure. That's why they have all of this media in their so-called black literary canon with all of these so-called black authors who they deem to be successes. And when they have these black authors who they deem to be successes, every story in that literary canon that you read ever since you are a child oftentimes presents you stories where all the black people are failures. And that is again, done deliberately by design because the goal of that media is to again 
program your mind with a perception of self, one, of being second best, two, of being not competent to be able to achieve or accomplish anything, and three, to be in a mindset where all, all the people you see that are black are all nothing but failures, nothing but competent, incompetent, nothing but capable of doing anything right, and program an idea in your mind to make yourself believe that you are inferior, you are incapable of being able to achieve or accomplish anything, or capable of being able to achieve success. That is what the literary canon and the mainstream media is all about. It's all about programming an idea in your mind that you as a black person cannot achieve anything, you cannot really accomplish anything, and if you make any effort to do anything, you will fail, or in the most extreme case scenario, you will die. That is what is programmed as related to their literary canon and to their media, and the white supremacist programs that idea in your mind because of their fear of black excellence. Now, when it comes to white supremacy, white supremacy wants to have a rigged game and they want to have a rigged game because white supremacy is based on a lie and because it's based on a lie, they wanna be able to make sure that they get a guaranteed result and because they want to make sure they get a guaranteed result of so-called white success, they have to rig the game to make the black person go into the game looking like a failure. So that's the reason, core reason why we have a lot of this media on their platforms like the original Good Times and the Good Times reboot, all about showing you black failure because in order for white supremacy to maintain its lie of black, of black people being failures and white people being successful, they need to promote a narrative of black incompetence and they need to promote that narrative of black incompetence on their platforms because they need you to believe this idea about yourself and get you to fit yourself into a black box that is acceptable to them. Now, I explored these concepts in one of my novels, Spellbound, where I talked about the whole concept of being a spellbound black person based on my experiences growing up in high school, because I noticed with a lot of kids in high school, they wanted to fit into this box that was acceptable to white people as related to their definition of being black and never wanted to come out of those definitions. And they didn't want to come out of those definitions because they wanted to remain in that place where they believed they would get acceptance and approval from white people. So this is why they wanted to stay in a ghetto because this was the place that the white supremacists program you to believe that you belong because when it comes to the white supremacists, they don't want to show you a picture of you being successful on your own and they don't want to show you a picture of you being successful on your own because if they, when it comes to white supremacy, they need to foster a codependent relationship with you and they need to foster the codependent relationship with you in order for them to maintain their power base. Because in the system of white supremacy, they need the black person to be at the bottom of the world in order for their world to be smooth. And in order to keep their world smooth, they need you to have a perception of self where you see yourself as inferior, where you see yourself as less than. And as you see yourself as less than, what you do is go out and start chasing them for approval instead of seeking the approval of the Most High God whose value should be the highest in your mind. But if you've got a mind that is caught up in the religion of white supremacy, 
you start seeing white supremacy as the ultimate ideal, and you start seeing white supremacy as the thing you need to seek the approval of more than God himself. This is how deep and insidious the white supremacy is on the black mind, and it's really deep and insidious on the black mind because getting us to believe that we are inferior is a major component of the mainstream media, and it's a major component of the mainstream media that makes it toxic for black people because as related to their media, their media is all about programming and, and giving us a mind to see ourselves again as less than and never think about establishing a standard of our own. No, the standard they have for us with their media is that we need to fit ourselves into their world of white supremacy and fit ourselves into these black boxes that are acceptable to black white people. And that's what the Netflix Good Times reboot is all about. It's all about the white supremacist fear of seeing black excellence, because when it comes to the white supremacist, they have been seeing glimpses of black excellence starting as far back as the 1980s, when we saw the golden age of black entertainment ushered in by men like the late Louis Gossett Jr and ushered in by many other black men, such as Bill Cosby, such as Spike Lee, such as Robert Townsend and the Hudlin brothers and many others who ushered in a golden age of black media where we started to see more balanced and humanized images of black people. And we started to see an image of black people aspiring for competence and aspiring for excellence. That's what we started to see with the golden age of black television and black cinema when black heterosexual men were in charge. And that era went came to a quick close in 1989 with the NWA hijacking the rap game with Straight Outta Compton. And it further became worse with John Singleton's film, Boys in the Hood, having a narrative tacked onto it, talking about how it was about the street life. That's how we started to see the narrative change because it started to come be taken away from black men's hands and be put back into the hands of the white supremacist who quickly started putting their images of black people on mainstream media platforms and while many black people were conned into believing this was quote unquote real, this wasn't real at all. No, like good times of the 1970s, none of this was real. No, this was all the vision of these white supremacists in the media arm of white supremacy. This was their perception of black people. This was their story and how they wanted to see us. And that's what makes a lot of this media extremely dangerous because we're not getting an authentic picture of black people on their media. And oftentimes what we get is their ideas about us. And, and almost every time we start to build some momentum, what happens is they try to take it away. Now, in, as, as we had the golden age taken away from us and we got the hood movie, and the Hood movie then devolved into Monsters Ball. We entered into an age of minstrels. And just as we start at this age of minstrels ushered in by Halle Berry, mainstreaming the image of the ghetto hood rat in Monsters Ball, this really took the black image into decline because as white supremacy gained control over the black image, this time they wanted to make sure that there wouldn't be another Bill Cosby to rise and take control of the black image. And to do that, what they did was go out and get themselves some black bootlicks to be the black face to represent two black people to say that this was a story of an authentic black experience. But this wasn't an authentic story about the black experience. 
No, this was the story that the white supremacist wanted you to see regarding the black image. And what they did was go out here and find themselves some black faces to represent their stories. And that's what they did when they went out here and elevated people like Lee Daniels, who ushered in this whole minstrel era with Monsters Ball and mainstreaming it. And then they went out here and found a patsy in Tyler Perry, a man who had no real cinematic experience. And they found this patsy as related to his lack of experience in filmmaking. And they gave him a mainstream media platform talking about how much of a success he was. But the whole thing is they only allow him to be a success because he was out here presenting the media that the white supremacists wanted to see regarding the black image. And again, they allowed him to be distributed on their platforms because it wasn't about art. Like Professor Black Truth has said before, this is all about mind control and it's all about warping your perception of self to fit yourself into this black box that's acceptable to white people and create that image of yourself where all you see yourself is in the white supremacist idea of the world and never have a vision of your own. And they use the black bootleg to go out here and represent passively that they are black and creating films about the black experience. But aggressively, all of these images and narratives fit right in line with white supremacy because every Lee Daniels movie is basically ghetto porn, which is all about showing you the most miserable and downtrodden black people. And Tyler Perry movies are all about demonizing black men in the same way that Oprah Winfrey and Alice Walker would demonize black men as these violent, out of control brutes and pushing the dark skin, white skin narrative to black women, that the dark skinned black man is this violent savage who can't control himself. And a black woman has to settle for a light skin or in his later films, non-black savior. That is the narrative he presents in his films and other films that Hollywood produces. They go out and produce these slave movies. Again, never really showing you a picture of black competence or black excellence. No, all you get to see are images of black people failing, black people, black women being abused by violent black men, and no one really working or striving for success. You never get to see that on mainstream media platforms. And even when you get a glimpse of something like Black Panther in 2018, because Black Panther is the film that has these Hollywood looking to make this Good Times reboot because they saw the impact of Black Panther on people's minds. Now, Black Panther wasn't the greatest film as related to the movie because it was very gynocentric. However, the images of Afrofuturism, the images of Black leadership, and black competence. This spooks white supremacy and it spooked white supremacy to the point where they wanted to try to destroy any sort of image of competence or excellence in their media. And that's how we got Wakanda, I mean Wakanda forever. And this was further exacerbated by the Netflix Good Times reboot. Again, all of this media fits a pattern and it fits a pattern because the pattern is all about programming an idea in your mind regarding black men and black women and black children. And it's all about programming an idea in your mind that black people are at the bottom of the world and they are never able to achieve success. They are not able to achieve success because they're not competent. They're not capable of achieving anything that's what the mainstream media wants you to see. Now, yes, they'll trot out a bootlick or a shill here or there to say, oh, there's a black person who had success, but the overall narrative is anti-black and it's all about, again, teaching you, no, you can't be competent, you can't be excellent, you can't have success like whites and non-blacks. No, the only people who can have success are white and non-black, 
And that is the core of the anti-Black racism in much of this media. And that's what the Good Times reboot was all about. And the reason why they wanted to do a reboot of Good Times was because the white supremacists wanted to have a good time seeing black people at the bottom of the world. And they wanted you to see black people at the bottom of the world because that's the image they feel comfortable with regarding our image on their media platforms. Because on their media platforms, this is what makes many of these white supremacists in Hollywood feel secure about their place in the world. And it makes many of the people who watch media feel comfortable about their place in the world because seeing the Evans family at the bottom of the world almost 40 years later, this makes many of the racists out here feel comfortable about their place in the world because if they have to see a black person going out here being a success, it makes all of those people scared and it makes them scared because one, you're seeing a black person who is shattering all of the white supremacist narratives that have been created about black people in this country. Two, you're seeing black people being humanized in a story where we see black people as people. And three, you're seeing a black person who as they shatter these stereotypes and ideas you have about the perception of black people are out here ready to compete. And as they are ready to compete, they are showing you black competence. Now, black competence, as I've talked about in videos this week, is very important because competence means that you are good at something. You are good at setting a goal for yourself working on the steps to accomplish that goal and, wor and working to finish whatever goal you, you, you're setting to do. And competence is something that a person builds over time, like myself as related to all of these books on the SJS Direct Imprint. I mean, a long time ago, back in 2009, I started out, I didn't really know much when I did the first book all about Marilyn, as related to publishing. I mean, I didn't know much about editing or glamour or punctuation and stuff like that, but I still persevered. And I didn't know about doing covers and I drew my own covers, but almost over a decade later, I'm producing books that are professional quality and on a professional level and paperback. And again, that just shows how I have become competent as a publisher. And as I have become competent as a publisher, I have looked to go on and take on other challenges as related to comics. And that's where back in 2022, I took on the challenge of creating the second comic and the first full comic on the SJS Direct imprint, John Haynes at Death's Door. I mean, I took on this challenge because not only did I want to go out and capitalize on the indie comics scene, I also wanted to take on this challenge to see that I could build my, and develop my skills as a publisher. So that's what this comic was partially about because as a person becomes competent in publishing trade books, you wanna take on different kinds of projects because as you do that, you're not just being competent, you're working towards excellence. And that's what every black child has to learn at an early age. But sadly, a lot of kids don't get this because in many of these public schools, we don't teach our kids about striving for competence. And after you become competent, you're supposed to strive for excellence. That was one of the core values of Bill Cosby's Cosby Show and A Different World and something Bill Cosby loved to promote in much of his media. He oftentimes talked about striving after you achieve competence to uh, strive for excellence and striving for competence means, yes, I know how to do something. My skills are sharp in an area. I am competent at doing things, but I have to persevere and look to do better. And that's where we start to go on the road to black excellence. Black excellence is something where we are not looking to meet some white person standard 
or some institution like Hollywood standard. No, we are looking to strive for our own standard. And as we look to strive for our own standard, what we're looking to do is raise that bar and do what we believe will be something that is next level. That's what I was trying to do back when I um, did the John Haynes at Death Store comic. And it's what I've been doing over the last couple of years as I've been doing more challenging stories like Isis Dark Incubus and the John Haynes Illuminati and Esteem Horror in the Hamptons. I have been looking to try to take on new challenges and evolve in my craft because I don't want to just be competent. No, I want to be excellent. And that's what I want to see brothers and sisters aspire for. I want us to start thinking of ourselves as looking to strive for competence, which is the basic standard for knowing what you're doing. And that's what competence is, that you have a standard that you know what you're doing. And then after you meet that bar for knowing the basics as related to a skill or a craft, you start striving to take that craft to the next level. I mean, that's the thing that we have to do for ourselves. And this is a core component of Black empowerment, because part of Black empowerment is us understanding that we have to start seeing ourselves as somebody who is smart, somebody who is capable, somebody who is capable of achieving competence. And then after we see ourselves as seeing ourselves as competent, we start looking to strive for excellence. This is how we have to see ourselves. And we have to start seeing ourselves as look as being better than what is presented to us in this mainstream media. This mainstream media, like this Good Times reboot, basically wants to take us down to a bottom level, but we have to look to rise to a higher level. I mean, that's what I learned growing up in the 80s watching The Cosby Show. That's what I learned growing up in a home with parents who pushed me to be the very best. I learned that I have to go out here and look to strive to be beyond competent and look to achieve excellence. That's something I wanted ever since I had a brain aneurysm at seven years old and kids were saying that I was slow and retarded. I wanted to present an image of intelligence and excellence. And we as a collective in the black community, we have to start seeing ourselves as excellent and looking to strive for comp excellence because the whole thing is white supremacy. They want to keep us at the bottom of the world. And part of the way they keep you at the bottom of the world is using their media as mind control to make you believe that the only place you can be is at the bottom of the world. And that's unacceptable for me as a black man in America. It is unacceptable for me, for any black person to see themselves at the bottom of the world living in a ghetto because the whole concept of the ghetto is something that is a white supremacist social construct. And it's a white supremacist social construct because a neighborhood doesn't have to be a ghetto. That is something that I saw firsthand when my father used to take me to the barbershop and I saw what happened to Sugar Hill. Sugar Hill showed us all that a black neighborhood doesn't have to be a ghetto and a black neighborhood can be about excellence because when you read about the history of Sugar Hill, like I did when I was doing my research for my novel, Spellbound, I talked about how this neighborhood was, again, this was a neighborhood built by Pullman porters and maids and people who were had black owned businesses. They oftentimes said black people couldn't own homes in other parts of the country, but black people owned homes in Harlem and they built a full black community. And this was not a ghetto. No, this was a neighborhood filled with working class, black men and black women who raised functional black children. This is what we could have as a black community, but we have to get a change of our perception of self. We do not come from a ghetto. No, we came from communities like Sugar Hill, like Black Wall Street, like Rosewood. Again, these were black communities 
built by black people and many of the white supremacists, they don't like the idea of hearing that, oh, black people are competent, black people are excellent, black people can build our own communities and neighborhoods. And they felt so upset about seeing this reality. This is one of the reasons why they basically destroyed Black Wall Street and Rosewood and literally got to the point where they were looking to bomb Black Wall Street with military planes because the whole idea of a Black community being filled with competent Black people who had a high quality of life, that really shattered the perceptions of many of these white supremacists and racists. It shattered their reality. It shattered their perception of Black people. It basically debunked all of the racist ideas they had. And it basically showed many of these racists that they could not rest on their laurels and be able to live in a world of white privilege. No, they had to go out and actually compete in a world. And that's the reason why they needed to have this media that creates a tether to co create codependent mindsets in Black people. They needed a tether to keep people codependent because after they erased Black Wall Street and Rosewood, again, literally put a highway over Black Wall Street to make sure that it would never exist. This was all about, again, looking to pro program an idea in people's minds that Black people are failures and that the only thing that is exists is things that show failure. But and when it comes to Sugar Hill, that was an actual picture of Black success. And that picture of Black success stayed for many years until we got to the era of integration. Because once we got into the era of integration, that's when a lot of spellbound Black folks sought to live in a place filled where they wanted to be accepted by white people. And as they looked to be accepted by white people, what they did was walk away from the neighborhood they built with a standard of excellence and showing us that you could have a full functional black community. And again, this is what the white supremacists feared. And again, they looked to use different tactics from terrorism to psychological warfare on black communities. And they use this to get keep black people from seeing ourselves as we really are. No, what they want you to do is buy into an image of self where you are at the bottom of the world. And they want you to buy into a picture where you see yourself as a failure and you see yourself as incapable of achieving anything unless there's some great white savior who's there to go out here and show you the ropes because the Negro is incapable of doing for self. No, he can't do for himself. He needs a white benefactor to tell him that he's successful, needs a benefactor to tell him that how to function in the world, can't learn how to do this for himself. No, that's what white supremacy tells black people. And they tell you this because Again, they fear that you can be competent on your own. They fear that you can't strive for excellence on your own. They fear that you can't go out here and do this. They fear that if you go out here and do this, this will prove that you are just as smart as anyone else. And it proves that you can compete on their level. This is what scares many racists out here. It scares them to see the idea of black people who are competent, black people who don't need to seek out the validation and approval of whites and non-blacks to tell them that they are good. It scares them when we have our own standard and it scares them when they see that our own standard is not only as good as their standard, but can surpass their standard. That's what really scares many of these people as a, related to the media arm of white supremacy. And that's what really scares them about seeing us start to take control over ourselves and our perception of self. Because when we start taking control over our perception of self, that means they don't have any power over us. And it means they don't have any power over us because 
if we are setting the standard for ourselves, that means we're not looking to fit into the black box that's acceptable to white people. And that's what I tried to show with the Matilda Crowley character in the book, Spellbound. And as she broke the spell off her mind, yes, she became a part of the goth subculture, but the goth subculture was a was sort of like a metaphor for us finding our own identity and defining ourselves, not looking to fit ourselves in somebody else's box, because fitting in somebody else's box is giving other people power over ourselves. And if somebody can get power over you, what they're going to look to do is get control over you. And as they look to get control over you, they get you buying into their standard of substandard. And as their standard of substandard becomes your standard, what happens is instead of you looking to achieve as related to your standard, what you do is bring yourself down to a level of substandard instead of taking yourself to a new level where we can see you being comp beyond going beyond competent to being excellent. And this is what they want to do with shows like The Good Times Reboot. Hey, Gboot2786, glad to see you here. I uh, usually appear on, on the Gboot2786 show on thir some Thursdays these days, and I'm glad to see him on the show tonight. Um, thank you, John Gilroy, um, for the super chat. He says, thanks for the great work, um, B1, and B1 back to you. And again, the whole thing about Black excellence is we have to start seeing ourselves as excellent. We have to see ourselves as being the very best as Black people and look to achieve excellence because, again, with the media arm of white supremacy, they want to tell you to be, be at the bottom, and they want to tell you that the best you can aspire to be is mediocre. And that's what they present on this Good Times reboot, basically taking us back to a place that doesn't even exist anymore. I mean, this is what I think I heard from Mr. Superboy a while back. I mean, Cabrini Green housing projects don't even exist anymore. They've basically been demolished, but the white supremacists like Self McFarlane, they basically want to take us back to the projects with the Evans family because taking us back to the projects makes their idea of the black world smooth. They want to keep us at the at, back in these projects because this is the place that they want to see you in. They basically want to keep black people in this ghetto. And again, ghetto is not a physical place. Ghetto is a psychological place. It is a place that is based on your perception of self because you could have black folks who live in Beverly Hills and have millions of dollars, but if their mind and their perception of self is messed up, they're not going to see the value in what they have to care about maintaining a standard of living. No, they're not going to see that at all. And that's where you get the whole perception of, of the mindset of seeing yourself as less than and seeing yourself as not deserving anything. And that's the core of self-hatred. The core of self-hatred is you as a black person not believing that you deserve the very best. You don't deserve success. You don't deserve to accomplish anything. And that's what the content of the media arm of white supremacy is all about reinforcing in your mind. It's all about reinforcing the idea in your mind that you don't deserve the best. You don't deserve to be competent. No, you can. the only thing you can aspire to be is mediocre, but it doesn't tell you, hey, you can be competent. You can be somebody who is good at what they do, and you can go beyond being good at what you do to looking to be excellent at what you do to the point where you become like an expert as related to mastery of craft. This is what they don't want you to see about yourself. And this is why they wage war on Black people with media like this Good Times Reboot. Because this media, like the Good Times Reboot, is just another shot against Black people in a series of salvos that have gone on over the last, I say, two decades. Because over the last 20 years, and I would say, ever since the start of the hood movies in the 90s. So I'll take it 30 years 
I mean, over the last 30 years, we've had an assault on the minds of black people. We've had an assault on the minds of brothers and sisters where we have been bombarded with images and messages that tell us we are inferior, we can't achieve success, there will always be a crab in a barrel to take it from us, and this is why we shouldn't even try, and we shouldn't try to look to achieve any sort of competence or excellence or persevere to achieve success. That's what we get told by this media, and when you're bombarded with these kind of images for over 30 years, it has an impact on your mind, and that impact on your mind is that you start to become afraid to look to persevere, to become competent, and start heading down the road to excellence. Because as you are being, again, pushed with this mind control and these subliminal anti-Black messages, what I see with a lot of people is this fear of looking to persevere towards competence or a and a fear to look to achieve black excellence and again because when they start to see that that whole mindset and perception start to change what in the media where they start to see these cracks form like with bill cosby in the 80s and they start this and the golden age from the 80s to the 90s and also with the black panther movie this is where white supremacy starts to become hypersensitive and insecure. And this is where they start to ratchet up these images and media that are anti-Black. And what they do as they are adapting is they've gone from going to produce these material themselves and find Black bootlicks to represent whatever ideas they have to now what they're doing because a lot of Black people are becoming hip to these bootlicks and shills. What they are doing is going out here and looking to import somebody to passively, again, represent Black, but aggressively represent anti-Black racism in this media. What they do is go out here and as they go out and find more bootlicks, again, they go outside of the United States to find their bootlicks. And as they go outside of the United States to find their bootlicks, they know that this person really is eager and desperate for this opportunity, and they will go out here and represent these ideas, and they will represent these ideas because they want these ideas to be able to springboard their career, but in a lot of cases, the reason why they have this person there is because they want a Black face to, again, represent their ideas and their ideas about Black people. It's never about us presenting our ideas about ourselves on these media platforms. It's never about us telling our stories. It's all about getting Black people to co-sign narratives and co-sign an anti-Black agenda. And that's what happened here with good times, both times. I mean, the first time you had uh, Mike Evans and the other guy, I can't remember his name, again, Eric Monty, and Eric Monty and Mike Evans they basically thought this was the opportunity of a lifetime with the original Good Times, but because those guys didn't know how dirty the entertainment industry was, what they did was think they were going to be able to make a show and be able to showcase Black people. And because they were desperate to be the first, what they did was sign on the dotted line, not understanding concepts that I have studied in books like Sid Field's screenplay and Robert McKee's story about the whole concept of adaptation. Because whenever you go and you sign away your rights to a Prodco, what happens is, is that you don't have any more creative control. And what they do is use the adaptation clause to be able to make the material that they want. Yes, they'll buy a story, but they're gonna make their version of the story. And that's how the entire narrative of Good Times got hijacked back in the 1970s. And the only way that we got to see a halfway decent show was because Eric Monty pushed back a bit. And we also saw uh, Esther Roll and John Amos push back really hard as related to much of the ideas they wanted to put in that Good Time show, showing us the worst about black people. And if it wasn't for those black folks pushing back, 
we would have gotten all of those ideas from Norman Lear because he would have used the adaptation clause to be able to make the show he wanted where yes, passively you got black people on TV and because black people were desperate for their image, they would think ghetto was a standard for black and not have any aspirations to look to leave the ghetto. But the whole way you leave the ghetto is not moving out of a ghetto. You have to get your mind right. That was one of the things that they got wrong about good times that I know growing up. You've got to get your head in the right place because if you don't get your head in the right place, any place you live will become a hood and not a functioning black community like Sugar Hill or Black Wall Street or Rosewood because those places became black communities because black people had their minds right. They understood that in order to have a community, you have to one, have ownership, two, you have to have stakes in it where you're building something and you have to work with like-minded people to maintain a standard of living for everyone. That's what you need in a real community, but this is not something you got told on a show like Good Times, which told you, oh, we want to get out of the ghetto, but getting out of the ghetto starts up here, not outside, because if you don't get this right, the, you'll go any place and it will be a wreck once again, because you won't have a standard for how you want to live, and you need to have that standard of how you want to live. And again, that ties right back to Black competence, and it also ties to Black excellence. Because in order to have a high-end neighborhood like Sugar Hill, you have to have competent Black people who are out here working on building a community, and you have to have people who have a standard of excellence to maintain that quality of life. And again, competence and excellence are how you build great communities because while you have Pete White folks talking about how the Upper West Side of Manhattan is one of the best places to live and the village in New York here is a great place to live and places like, like the East Upper East Side is good for families, those places are high quality neighborhoods because the mindset of the people are all about maintaining a standard of living, maintaining a standard as related to their homes and how they keep them, maintaining a standard of how they have their schools. I mean, there's no pookies and Ray Ray's acting up in their schools. They don't allow their kids to act like that because the parents get on the kids. Again, there's a standard there. And again, you have to get your head in that place for excellence because you're not gonna be able to have that unless you get your head in the game. And white supremacy's whole goal is to keep you from getting your head in the game. And that's why they go out here and take the time to use this media as mind control to get you to be persuaded to see this negative perception of self. They want you to see this negative perception of self because they don't want you to make your neighborhoods excellent. They don't want your kids to be focused on becoming competent as related to their education. They don't want your families focused on being the very best at what they do, excuse me, because that represents competition. And when it comes to white supremacy, they do not like to compete because competition means that they cannot be in their comfortable place where they can receive all the benefits and all the privileges that they enjoy their middle-class lifestyles from. Because in order for them to get the 97% of your black dollars and be able to live that middle-class lifestyle, they need you to have a mindset where you see yourself as less than. And as you see yourself as less than, you're out here chasing these folks. And as you chase these folks, you're out here spending money to be like them instead of looking to be the very best you. And as you're spending that money, you don't see how you're putting yourself in an economic hole where all you're doing is chasing mediocrity as related to fitting yourself in a black box where you're acceptable to white people instead of looking to look to achieve competence and excellence. That's what this is all about. And again, in order to get you on that road, they need media like this Good Times reboot, and they need you to be in a place where you're sitting there watching Good Times, 
thinking, oh, this is the ideal for black people. No, that's not an, our ideal of ourselves. And now that we live in an age of the internet and social media, we have an opportunity to craft our own image of self. We have an opportunity to show the world that we can create our own standard of competence. And as we create our own standard of competence, we can go out here and strive for black excellence. I mean, this is what I do with the SJS Direct books. Again, I wanna show you pictures of black competence and black excellence. I mean, images of us showing us with power and taking power and empowering ourselves. I mean, showing us images of ourselves being strong, showing stories where we are intelligent, showing stories where we are responsible and capable of being able to lead and run businesses, being able to go out here and think critically and problem solve and being able to show us as leaders. I mean, this is what it's all about. And this is what new black media is all about. I mean, new black media is all about us creating media that looks like us, media that shows us in a positive light, media that shows us as competent. And as we are in our competence, we are striving for excellence. That's what new black media is all about. Now, Professor Black Truth says media, new black media is all of us, but all of us have to start supporting new black media that looks to elevate us. I mean, that's what I do here on the SJS Direct Imprint. I look to go out here and show you the picture of black excellence. And the only way I can go out here and continue to do this is with your support. And that's where we as black people, as a collective, have to start facing our fears. Because with a lot of black folks, we fear being competent and we fear striving for excellence because we want to, again, fit into the black box that's acceptable to white people. We want to seek white validation and white approval. And because we are scared of looking to create our own standard. What we do is go out and sit here scared, and we sit here scared thinking we have to let somebody else speak for us. And this is why black bootlicks like the ones who, like Lee Daniels, Oprah Winfrey, and Tyler Perry, get in front of our stories and start putting these white supremacist narratives out here as our stories, what they do is go out here and because we are too scared to set our own standard, we accept somebody's substandard. And again, they will put the rubber stamp, the black bootlets standard as a high standard like they did with Halle Berry's performance in Monsters Ball and Denzel Washington's performance as a super brute in Training Day. They will make that the gold standard. But when I look at those movies as a black man who has a sense of self-love and a sense of self-worth, those movies, to me, that's not an Oscar-winning performance. No, that's substandard, and I refuse to accept substandard as my standard, and I urge Black people, you know, we got to face our fears and say we can do better. That was one of the things I said on the Fox Soul Show about a year ago. I mean, you can't settle for these slave movies and these hood movies. This is not who we are. No, that's the picture they want us to see of ourselves at the bottom of the world. But I want you to start seeing yourself in a picture where you see yourself as the front and center, where you see yourself as somebody who can achieve and accomplish. I want you to see yourself as the picture of success. And I want you to see yourself as somebody who can go out here and be the very best. That's what I want you to see yourself as. And that's one of the reasons why I work so hard on the SJS Direct Imprint. And that's why I work so hard on the kind of stories that I write, because I want you to start seeing yourself as working on the road to competence and working on the road to excellence. Because I want you to see yourself as being somebody who's capable of doing better than the white supremacist standard of substandard, because when it comes to a lot of their media, their media is substandard, and they want us to accept substandard. 
as related to our image. They want us to settle for their substandard. Well, I say it's time for us to go and raise that bar because that's what I saw growing up from guys like Robert Townsend. That's what I saw from guys like Bill Cosby. That's what I saw from guys like Spike Lee and the Hudlin brothers. I saw them raising the bar. And the sad part is, is as they raise the bar, the NWA and the manipulation of John Singleton's Boys in the Hood brought the bar back down. But we have to understand what they're looking to do is keep that bar in the ground as related to our standard because they don't want our standard to be high because if our standard is higher than theirs, then that proves that their whole idea and mindset of self of being superior is all the lie it actually is because it is a lie that their films are better than ours their TV shows are better than ours, and the Netflix Good Times reboot shows me how much how inferior their shows are because this is just a cut and paste of Seth MacFarlane's Family Guy, The Cleveland Show, and The PJs put together, and I can do a far better job than that, and I believe I can do that because I wrote 13 episodes of the All About Nikki first season that I believe would blow the doors off a Good Times reboot and showing you a black girl in Beverly Hills Again, showing us black people being successful, showing us black people being competent, and a black father looking to raise a daughter and teach her about black excellence. I know I could do better than this Good Times reboot on my worst day. I know I could do better than this show because I'm all about black excellence because black excellence is about empowering black people. And again, we can do better than this trash. We can do better than this. And we have to understand we have the way we do better than this is by having our own standard and our own standard can be way better than us settling for some scraps and leftovers of a cut and pasted family guy, PJs and Cleveland show where we get everything tacked together. I mean, we can do way better than this. We can do far better than a Good Times reboot because I know this for a fact because when I write t TV shows like I wrote all about Nikki's first season, I was looking to do better than this. I was looking to show you a black man being a responsible father. I was looking to show you a daughter who wasn't running the streets but was looking to be responsible. I was looking to show you a black family, even though they had a divorce, where you still had a structure to that family and show you how black life works among the wealthy. I mean, if I can go out here and be a guy who was living in Section 8 housing at the time and go out here and do this and put fingers to the keyboard in less than six months and write a whole season of a show, then why after three years couldn't Seth MacFarlane, Steph Curry, and the late Norman Lear come up with a better show than what they did with this garbage animated series. Critical question I would like to ask Steph Curry and Seth MacFarlane. I mean, I mean, if I can do this in my own bedroom, why can't you do this? I mean, if I can come out here and look to present black excellence to people, I mean, I don't I know Hollywood doesn't want you to see black excellence because of the response to Black Panther. I mean, I look at that movie and again. A lot of the images spooked a lot of these white folks seeing all that Afrofuturism, seeing a black man being a king. I mean, that basically freaked out people. That's why we got the Killmonger character being presented as sympathetic. They don't like you seeing black men in, as competent or excellent. They don't like you to see black men leading a family. They don't want you to see this because, again, it shatters their ideas about black people because the idea of the irresponsible black father, that's a white supremacist construct because if we look at the history as the late David Carroll tried to show you, black families were intact and black fathers were running families until the rise of the feminist movement. And it was the rise of the feminist movement that basically was the thing that took out the last couple of black communities like Sugar Hill in the 70s. I mean, because once you took that father out of the home and, the, and some of the people moved out to other areas, that's what basically led to the decline of the black community. And they don't want to talk about that part because originally with good times, they wanted to show it 
as a black single mother fitting into the anti-black agenda. And again, this was all about promoting ideas in our minds about ourselves and getting us to drop ourselves to the level of substandard instead of saying we can do better than this. And if we can't do well in that system, we will go out and make our own system. That's what I had to do with the publishing industry because at the time of the late 90s, I made the mistake, and I will admit I made a mistake, by querying all of those publishers in the 90s because I thought back then, because I saw the success of Bill Cosby and Robert Townsend and people even like Terry McMillan, I thought that, oh, the, there was a place for a positive story about black men and a story about black people, but I didn't understand that the publishing arm of American media is a part of the media arm of white supremacy and all they wanna see is a certain narrative regarding black people. And that narrative is seeing black people being miserable and seeing black people looking, being at the bottom of the world, even though they are single successful educated black women, they still wanna see you at the bottom of the world. They don't want to see you as the picture of success. No, you can't have a man that is a husband at all. No, the black woman in these 90s books basically had to settle for a man. Again, a role not defined by God, a role that was created by feminists. Oh, you are looking for a man, not a husband. Meanwhile, the white girls in all of the books like Sex in the City and all the other white girl books, they're looking for husbands. They're looking for long-term relationships and commitments. But you, But black girls are told, oh, you got to go look for a man. And again, that's all part of the anti-Black racism that's between the lines of their media. They don't want you to see a Black woman looking for a husband. They don't want you to see a Black woman being successful in a relationship because if you see the Black woman being successful in a relationship, oh, that burns up the white girls, but they don't want to talk about that. But I talk about that in All About Maryland, where I talk about Oh, the white girls, they have a deep jealousy of seeing a successful black woman having the ultimate success of marriage, and they don't want you to see that. And again, they want you to see the black woman being miserable. That's why we got all the Tyler Perry movies with all the black women getting beat up by super brute, because it, they don't put that in their movies with the white girls. No, you don't get to see the white girl getting beat up by super brute white man with the big wide mustache, like they did in the movie Sleeping with the Enemy that came out in the 80s. No, you don't get to see that black person, that, that white person like that. You get to see the black person like that though, but you don't get to see the white boy being presented as the image of being a violent super brute. No, that's because they always present the image of white excellence and they present the image of the white man being somebody competent in their literature in their TV shows and in their films, they always look to try to show you the white male as somebody competent. Even though they have the bumbling, stumbling dad, he's still shown as more competent than the black man, who is shown again as a super brute and a deadbeat, and shown as the super brute, again, who looks to beat up on black women. And again, this is why we cannot settle for their substandard. No, we have to have a better standard we have to strive for excellence because excellence is how we get to see the very best about ourselves. And when we see ourselves as the very best, guess what? You look to pursue the very best. I mean, this is something that they put in their media. They don't want to see you being successful, but I want you to see yourself successful. Um, case on, they, why is Michael a baby selling drugs? Because white supremacy loves seeing us saying, oh, we can't find jobs. We can't go out here and make money legally. That's an old racist trope that, is, that came out in the 70s. Oh, the black man got to sell drugs because he can't find a job. But I look at that and I say, no, you got all these black men out here and all these opportunities. I mean, you got all these opportunities like I had where I did a crowdfunding project for this John Haynes comic. I mean, I do print on demand books. You got folks out here with YouTube channels that have over 100,000 subs where people are buying houses, but you got Seth telling us a baby got to sell drugs in a project that don't exist in Chicago anymore. 
and this is supposed to be black entertainment. No, that's not black entertainment for me. That just shows me how white supremacy is just about looking to program an idea in your mind that you have to settle for their substandard as your standard, but I'm telling you that you don't have to settle for their substandard as your standard. No, you can walk away from their media like many of these other people are walking away from their media. And that's why a lot of those people are saying, um, get woke, go broke, because they aren't accepting these ideas from Hollywood anymore. And you shouldn't accept them either. No, you can do better than their substandard. And you do better when you pick up new black media, like the SJS Direct Imprint, because as you see, as you start seeing media where you see yourself as empowered and taking power, what you start to do is see yourself in a positive light. And as you start to see yourself in that way, what happens to you is that your whole perception of self changes. And I have testimonials from people on many live streams who told me, hey, I picked up these Isis and John Haynes books and it basically changed my perception of self. It basically changed the way I saw who I was. And again, this is what happened to me in my life growing up as a kid. I mean, this is what the Cosby show and all those neat films like House Party and all these other movies did and, my, and reading comics like Milestone. I mean, it basically changed my perception of self and started me saying, hey, I want to go out here and not just be competent, but also be excellent. And it made me look to persevere to be excellent, even though I couldn't work in mainstream companies because they wouldn't open a door for me. I went to look to go build my own. I mean, that's what I did when God told me to keep going when I lost my job at City College. I looked to be excellent and I looked to be excellent because I'm not afraid to be excellent. I'm not afraid to be excellent because I want to be the very best as related to writing. I want to be a master of a craft. I am, and that's why I'm urging you not to be afraid to be excellent because again, we can do better than the place that white supremacy wants to put us. We can do far better than that. And we can do better than a good times reboot where the only people having a good time are racists basically laughing at the same old jokes they laughed during, about at, during slavery regarding black people. I mean, you got racists basically laughing at the same old jokes that they laughed at over 400 years ago. And it's time for us to get the last laugh. And it's time for us to get the last laugh by taking our power. And this is what got a lot of people upset at an image that I had Mike Williams commissioned to do. I mean, when I had this image of John Haynes, Godbreaker made a lot of people got upset and I understood why they got upset because it's an image of a black man taking white power and holding Thor's hammer. And this book got so many people upset because it is an image of black excellence. It's an image of black competence. It's an image of a black man going and being so excellent that he takes it to the next level by taking power. And this was an image that I didn't expect to have that type of effect on people, but it showed me that, you know, a lot of people, they're afraid of actual black images of black power and black empowerment. They're afraid of seeing us in images where we are showing ourselves as competent and excellent to the point where we are looking to be masters as related to taking power. Now, I never meant that to be the whole story point of John Haynes, Godbreaker, but a lot of people took it that way. I mean, I remember when Coffee Comics got upset about this. Again, this is a black man from overseas getting upset. And again, showed me how the impact of an image can just basically freak some people out. But I know if a lot of kids start seeing these kind of images, it can change their perception of self where you're not seeing yourself as being a thug or a gangster or some hood guy talking about traps, houses, you can see yourself as building houses and building a full community. Because when you see yourself in a position of power and you see media that shows you in power, guess what it makes you wanna do is go out here and persevere to take your own personal power. It makes it where you want to say, hey, I, I can do better than this. I can do better than this. And again, this is the kind of media I make because again, 
I understand that those who control the money control the media, and those who control the money control the narrative. And that's why I take what little money I have to make a narrative for Black people, because I understand that we have to be able to th see ourselves as excellent, and we have to get over this fear of seeing ourselves as excellent, because there's some folks out here, they get afraid, oh, the white people are going to see how smart I am. These white folks, it's like, I don't care about those folks. It's about us having our own standard. And when we have our own standard, we go and support our media that empowers us because we should be the ones having a good time watching our own media and not looking to seek the validation and approval of other people's media. Now, I'm going to get ready to wrap up tonight's stream because I got some work I got to do on Spinsterella Goth Girl Summer, which is the next book coming out in 2025. And if you want to pick up the book Spellbound, it's available on Amazon.com. And that book basically shows you how to break out of the Spellbound mindset where you're keeping to fit yourself in a black box that's acceptable to white people and thinking that you have to accept the stereotypes like the ones in the Good Times reboot. And again, I have other positive black fiction on the SJS Direct imprint, like the books in the um, John Haynes series, the books in the ISIS series. This is a new Amari's Revenge refresh that I did because a lot of people missed out on that book. And the, and the ISIS Dark Incubus, and again, the Steam Horror in the Hamptons. And you can get all of these books on Amazon.com. I mean, Dark Incubus and Horror in the Hamptons will be out April 26th and May 24th but you can get Amari's Revenge and John Haynes' Illuminati right now on Amazon right now in paperback. And you can also get it on Kindle and Google Play and iBookstore and Smashwords as well in digital format. And you can pick up the first full John Haynes comic, John Haynes at Death Store on Lulu.com right now. And you can pick up John Haynes at Death Store, the first John Haynes comic on Lulu right now. And um, that also helps the channel as well. And it helps me be able to, again, make more comics and videos. So every book you support helps me to continue to continue building the SJS Direct imprint and creating more positive black fiction. I mean, this really helps me as related to the fiction and the nonfiction and helps me grow the SJS Direct imprint. So um, those are all the books in the SJS Direct imprint that I'm promoting tonight. And again, if you also want to help out the channel and help me be able to stay on the air you can donate to the cash app as well i get 100 percent of the cash apps whereas the super chats youtube takes the money but with the cash apps i get 100 percent, and it's all able to help me to stay on the air and be able to keep going as related to building more positive media for brothers and sisters out here so i want to thank everybody for coming out to tonight's stream i really appreciate you guys spending your night and your morning with me and I hope you'll be here for next week's stream. Everybody have a good evening and everybody have a good night.